Maybe of Somalia. Okay, we're back at the video. Sangue meio príncipe tomou agenda 2030 de desenvolvimento sustentável como base da sua política de desenvolvimento para permitir um futuro melhor para todos os sentimentos em harmonia com os seus ecossistemas naturais. In recent years, the country has made significant progress in the implementation of the SDGs, especially in health, education, which are the key of development of human capital. Maternal and infant mortality has consistently reduced and communicable diseases, including malaria, are no longer the main cause of mortality. Santomians are living longer. The country has achieved gender parity in basic education and is achieving high schooling rates at all levels. However, as one of the smallest economies in Africa, the country still faces many challenges in efforts towards sustainable development, especially in terms of human and financial resources necessary to implement the 2030 Agenda. Given its archipelagic nature and location, it remains highly vulnerable to climate change facing, in recent years, rising sea levels, deforestation, intense and controlled rainfall, falls and landslides, with a devastating effect on food crops, production and exports. These challenges hamper agriculture, tourism and fishing sectors, movement of people and goods with devastating impacts on the economy and endangering the lives of the population. The impacts of external shocks such as COVID-19 and Ukraine-Russia war impose a pressing need for Santo Tome Principe to build resilience and strengthen human capital development, either through adaptation and mitigation measures or through structural transformation economy diversification. This scenario requires the country to redouble efforts to achieve the SDGs, especially by strengthening technical and institutional capacity and building more resilient socioeconomic infrastructures, which requires substantial resources that, unfortunately, the country does do not have. Santo Tomé Príncipe defende que é necessária uma ação global para combater as mudanças climáticas, apoiar a liderança demonstrada pelos CIDES, particularmente nas energias renováveis. Temos que continuar a trabalhar juntos para construir um Santo Tomé Príncipe mais sustentável, justo, seguro e inclusivo, onde ninguém fique para trás. Um. We just saw the video that was part of Satomas um, and Principal's presentation, and now we move on to the next uh, presentation. Um, we will hear the Voluntary National Review by Somalia, and I invite Mr. Sharmark Kara, Director General of the National Bureau of Statistics of Somalia, to make the presentation. You have the floor, sir. We will first have a video. Somalia is located in the Horn of Africa, mainland Africa's easternmost country, covering 637,000 square kilometers and a terrain consisting mainly of plateaus, plains and highlands. Somalia has the longest coastline in Africa, stretching over 3,300 kilometers along the Gulf of Aden to the north and the Indian Ocean to the east and south. It has land boundaries with three countries, Djibouti, Ethiopia and Kenya. Somalia is increasingly susceptible to environmental and climate change impacts due to its geographical setting, with most of the country considered arid and semi-arid lands. The country suffers disproportionately from the climate-related crisis, despite contributing very minimally to droughts, intermittent floods and desert locust infestation 
have resulted in the loss of livestock and crop production, which account for more than 60% of GDP and directly and indirectly employs millions. Moreover, the impact of climate change and conflict are interlinked in Somalia. The environment conflict nexus disproportionately affect the most vulnerable, particularly women and children. Considerable demographical shifts from rapid urbanisation caused by climate change have also negatively transformed the economy and Somali society. Following 23 years of civil strife and state collapse that devastated the economy, infrastructure and public institutions, in 2012 the Somali people agreed to a provisional constitution, formed its parliament and constituted the Federal Republic of Somalia, comprising of the federal government and the federal states. Somali lawmakers voted in a new president on the 15th of May 2022, marking the third federal election since 2012, resulting in yet another successful peaceful transfer of power and further solidifying Somalia's democratic stability. <laughs> In the past decade, Somalia has made significant development progress with the establishment of a federalised system of government, with step-by-step -step efforts leading to the envisioned federal state structure. Somalia has also made good progress in recent years in its institutional and economic reconstruction with significant macro-fiscal reforms supported by the IMF, which have led to sustained economic growth. The security situation has improved over the past years, but still requires significant attention to realise the goal of a fully stable and peaceful country. Somalia's commitment to achieving the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is solid and well-founded, and this commitment is clearly articulated in the Ninth National Development Plan. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is an ambitious undertaking especially for a country such as Somalia. In the fragile economic and political context, tackling multi-dimensional poverty, as well as implementing complex institutional renovations, have been monumental undertakings. The nation's annual budget is slowly aligning to the SDGs to ensure policy outcomes and to facilitate better monitoring. The government is also adopting a pragmatic approach through a phased implementation of the SDGs under the principles of inclusion and sustainability. Somalia's first BNR process has provided a unique and welcomed opportunity to take stock and reflect on Somalia's immense progress, while also gauging national capacity and gaps, particularly in policy making. This process has also helped to reaffirm the government's national commitment towards the implementation of the SDGs. The launch in June 2022 of the online SDG data visualization dashboard and the online goal tracker to monitor the performance of the SDGs will improve SDG monitoring while increasing public awareness and participation in the process. Vice President of ECOSOC, His Excellency Diego Rodriguez, the Permanent Representative of Bolivia to the UN, Vice President of El Salvador, Distinguished Ministers, Excellencies, Delegates, Ladies and, uh, ladies and Gentlemen. I am speaking on behalf of the Minister of Planning of the Federal Government of Somalia, His Excellency Ambassador Gamal Hassan, who could not be here today because the recent uh, elected administration is about to form its uh, new cabinet within the next few days. If I may start with an overview of the key facts uh, about Somalia. Somalia is located in the Horn of Africa and has, a la yeah, has, a, has the longest coast in Africa, stretching over 3,300 kilometers, th kilometers along the Gulf of Aden to the north and the Indian Ocean to the east and south. It has land boundaries with Djibouti, Ethiopia, and Kenya. Following 23 years of civil strife, and a state collapse that devastated the economy, infrastructure, and public institutions. In 2012, the Somali people agreed to a provisional constitution, formed its parliament, constituted the federal government of Somalia, comprising of the federal government of Somalia and the federal, Republic, uh, federal uh, member states. Somali law lawmakers voted in a new president on the 15th of May 2022, marking the 
third federal election since 2012 and yet another peaceful transfer of power, Somalia has achieved remarkable progress in advancing critical economic reforms supported by the IMF that culminated in achieving the HIPIC decision point in March 2022. Another critical fact that we shall see more of in later slides is the fact that Somalia is increasingly susceptible to environmental and, and climate change impacts. In preparation for the VNR, five consultation workshops were held involving more than 200 uh, stakeholders, including government and civil society. Consultations with civil society revealed profound awareness and engagement in SDGs by women and youth groups and academia. One university had already been conducting research on Somalia's SDG implementation for the past three years. We also tried to make our VNR as evidence-based as possible and used data from recent surveys. Somalia has developed an online data visualization dashboard and an online goal tracker to monitor the performance of the SDGs. Both platforms strengthen coordination and data availability by providing a transparent and interactive platform to track Somalia's progress towards the SDGs. Specifically, the dashboard presents infographs of all data, available data with each goal by reporting against the targets and indicators. The goal tracker explores the data and has uh, it is own function to download the data sources. We are presenting the goal tracker at a special virtual session entitled VNR Lab 14, Data Innovations for Evidence-Based VNR, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. The ninth National Development Plan which runs from 2020 to 2022 is the national instrument for implementing the SDGs in Somalia. 80 of the 180, 103 indicators from the NDP9 are directly aligned with the SDGs. The next few slides will be about Somalia's progress on SDGs, starting with the economy. Remittances are an important source of, of income in Somalia where the unemployment rate is just over 20%. Individuals' remittance to Somalia has been increasing since the start of COVID. Somalia's economy has been growing almost double digits before the COVID-19. But real GDP in 2020 shrunk by 0.3% as a result of flooding, locust invasion, and COVID-19. Somalia's economy is dollarized, with the U.S. dollar accounting for 98% of transactions. The inflation rate in Somalia has been increasing in the last two years, resulting in an overall increase of more and services went up 30% during this period. Also, food is up 15%. The inflation rate is largely as a result of global issues such as the rise in oil prices, the, U the war in U Ukraine, COVID-19, but there are also local factors such as drought and desert locust invasion. A notable progress has been made in water and sanitation with significant increase in the number of people accessing water services and a significant decrease in the proportion of people practicing open defecation. Also, a remarkable progress has been made in industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Mobile and internet infrastructure have flourished under what is largely a self-regulated private sector system with internet and mobile access being comparatively inexpensive. Access to 3G data has increased from, uh, for, by 40% in 2000, sorry, from 40% in 2016 to 65% in 2017. In the health sector, Somalia made progress in improving its maternal mortality rate, but work is uh, underway to also improve other indicators in the health sector. The education uh, sector was heavily impacted by the dissolution of the central government in 1991. 
However, as security improves, Somali intellectuals, including the newly elected president who has a background in the education sector, and businesses revived the sector by establishing and reopening education institutions across the country in the last two decades. The government is progressively assuming its role in undertaking key interventions to revive the education sector. However, challenges remain. Almost 80% of uh, the adults in Somalia experience moderate or severe food insecurity. The country is currently in a severe drought which continues to keep the region in the grasp of famine. Despite uh, growing urbanization and expanded use of renewable energy, access to clean and renewable energy have actually decreased. Three quarters of the gender-based violence are reported in the internally displaced settlements. It's also worth noting that Somalia has a large number of IDPs. The COVID-19 pandemic has initially exacerbated GBV rates, but has since come down back to pre-pandemic rates. The number of women elected as representative in the federal parliament have slightly decreased from 24% in 2016 to 20% in 2022. However, for the first time in Somalia's history, a woman was elected as a deputy speaker of the parliament, the most powerful position elected to a woman in Somalia. On the right is a picture of the outspoken deputy speaker of the federal parliament, Honorable Ms. Saadia Samatar. As uh, mentioned earlier, Somalia has suffered from uh, more frequent and prolonged climate-related disasters such as drought, floods, and locust invasion in the last two years. These disasters continue to destroy Somalia's ecosystem, threaten food security, and inflict conflict over scarce resources. Notwithstanding, notwithstanding these challenges, the Somali government has made considerable effort to institutionalize and mainstream adaptations to build resilience to the worsening impact of climate change. Challenges abound in Somalia. Below is a highlight of the key constraint in our VNR. One of the significant challenges was actually that data was hard to come by, so in many instances we used data collected by international agencies as proxy data. As, as a way forward and next steps to address challenges, we plan to document lessons learned and improve coordination and engagement with, uh, with SDG stakeholders. One of the key takeaways from Somalia's VNR preparation is the importance of data for planning and monitoring progress, and the need to build national statistical capacity and improve collaboration and coordination with international partners. Somalia's VNR process has provided a unique and welcome opportunity to take stock of Somalia's immense progress while also gauging national capacity and gaps, particularly in policy making. It is our hope that this report acts as a reference point and based, a good baseline to review the progress to, and to build on future VNRs, as well as inform policymakers and international par partners alike. Somalia has a long way to go in to achieve the SDGs and considerable support is needed to accelerate progress at the level required to attain Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development. As the government embarks on structural, legislative, institutional reforms to serve the people better and achieve goals that, uh, that are set out in the NDP9 and the SDG, Somalia faces headwinds in the form of economic contraction brought about by COVID-19 and severe droughts. But the SDGs provide firm pillars in, on which, ba which to base development. The country continues to move forward, instilling peace, prosperity, and unity at the heart of every Somali man, woman, and child. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of the Somalia VNR presentation. I thank you for listening. We look forward to your remarks, questions, comments, and suggestions. Thank you very much. I thank the Director General of the National Bureau of Statistics of Somalia for the presentation, and we'll now hear comments and questions from states and other participants. Delegations and participants who wish to intervene are invited to press the microphone button on the console. 
I want to emphasize that um, since we are very behind schedule, um, the limitation of two minutes per um, uh, intervention would be observed and the microphone phones will be automatically cut off. So please be considerate and um, try to uh, fit in your statements into two minutes allocated. And um, the first speaker I have on my list is Finland to be uh, followed by a representative of the civil society. You have the floor, Finland. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I wish to congratulate all the VNR presenting countries. My comments are for Somalia. Finland commends Somalia for the commitment expressed to achieve the SDGs. Finland welcomes the launch of the national social protection policy and hope that the Bahnano program will expand and be able to provide well-targeted social safety nets for those who need the support. Existing national social protection systems will strengthen Somalia's resilience and capacity to respond to the humanitarian challenges caused by conflict and climate-related shocks, such as the current severe food crisis. In order to provide services in social protection, education and health, as well as in other sectors, it is important that the responsibilities of different levels of government are clearly defined. My question, therefore, is what further steps do you foresee to be taken to make the division of responsibilities of different levels of government clearer? Thank you. I thank the representative of Finland for his comments and question, and I now give the floor to uh, the representative of Education and Academia Stakeholder Group to be followed by the Dominican Republic. You have the floor. Good morning. Good morning. Cordial greetings to all of those in this room. Our uh, organization was created in 2013. We fight throughout South America for the right to education, which is considered to be key. We recognize the progress made by El Salvador in regard to education. My question is to the representative of the government of El Salvador is, how have the structural changes and the progress achieved in terms of providing digital tools in education affected the overall situation. What other new and innovative methods and tools have been used to ensure further progress of the education reform guaranteeing equal rights and access to all members of society? We recognize the actions of the government in the context of the pandemic, which has made it possible for a broader segment of the population to have access to digital methods of education. Further, access to the Internet has been broadened, but to guarantee continued progress, the curricula need to be adapted to the new methods and technologies, including further investment in education, which has reached about 5% of the total state budget. It's the Dominican Republic to be followed by a representative of the workers and trade unions. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Esteemed Vice President of the Republic of El Salvador and Vice Minister for Foreign Relations, friends, we congratulate El Salvador on its second voluntary national review and the great achievements demonstrated in fighting to combat poverty and achieve sustainable development goals. My question also has to do with the use of digital tools to monitor the progress accomplished. 
what have been the greatest challenges in introducing and applying these new digital methods? Thank you very much. The representative of the Dominican Republic, and now I give the floor to the representative of workers and trade unions to be followed by the Philippines. Somalia is facing many challenges for the implementation of SDGs. Political instability and persistent terrorism are seriously putting sustainable development at stake, and additional efforts need to be made in the areas of peace, stability, and good governance, while moving away from the continued abuse and misuse of the rule of law and security forces to curtail the rights to freedoms of expression and association, including endangerment of journalist safety. The country suffers from incredibly high levels of poverty and informality, poverty wages, and unsustainable unemployment. Minority clan members, women, and people with disabilities continue to face extreme marginalization in terms of access to health, education, work opportunities, or emergency relief. The social protection system is a very precarious and needs to be strengthened. Gender equality in an endemic challenge, and child labor is vastly extended. Although the government has advanced in engaging and consulting with the civil society organizations, commitment to leave no one behind are still missing, and mission is to address inequalities, remove discrimination, and protect vulnerable populations, such as internally displaced persons living in campus, minority groups, women, youth, and elderly persons need to be put into place. The government should take steps to implement a one-person, one-vote electoral system. I would like to ask the government of Somalia what it is doing in realizing SDGs, particularly SDG 16 and SDG 8 in creating decent jobs. How will the government respond to the challenges around the disaggregated data to allow for more targeted response to poverty and inequality? Uh, I thank the representative of the workers and trade unions, and I now give the floor to the Philippines to be followed by Norway. Thank you, Madam President. Our congratulations to El Salvador, Satome, and Principe, and Somalia for their excellent VNR presentations. The Philippines continues to find ways to further improve its implementation and monitoring of the SDGs. We are therefore particularly interested to know more about the institutional architecture and arrangements in El Salvador for the implementation of the SDGs. Thank you. I thank the representative of the Philippines and I'll give the floor to Norway to be followed by Switzerland. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I would like to join others in congratulating all the countries on the podium with successful VNRs. Uh, my comment is for the Federal Republic of Somalia. I'd like to congratulate you in particular on submitting your very first VNR on the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, from Norway, we would like to commend you on your substantial progress in terms of debt relief and public financial management. This is the result of consistent efforts on the part of the government of Somalia, and we are proud to have supported you all along in these efforts. So my question is, what will Somalia do to more sustainably finance your public expenditures? For many years, Somalia's tax-to-GDP ratio was among the lowest in the world, at least, at le sorry, at less than 3%. So I would like to ask whether you are planning to increase domestic taxation in order to support further development. We look forward to cooperating with you and your new government towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, and we wish you all the best in those efforts. Thank you. I thank the representative of Norway, and then I give the floor to the representative of Switzerland to the follow by representative of the women's group. Switzerland, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, let me start by complimenting El Salvador, uh, Satom and Principe, and Somalia on their achievements in the implementation of the SDGs and for their excellent presentation today. Rapid urbanization affects the achievement of the SDGs significantly. While protracted displacements to urban centers pose challenges, development in rural agricultural areas may offer opportunities. 
How is Somalia addressing the effects of urbanization while strengthening the resilience in rural, rural areas? Thank you very much. I thank the representative of Switzerland for the question. And now I give the floor to the representative of women group, a women's group to be followed by Denmark. Thank you, ma Madam Moderator. Uh, my question is to Sao Tome and Principe. We recognize the situation that Sao Tome and Principe is positioned as a small island state and that it therefore faces particular pressures from climate change, including major impacts of increased tropical storms and the risk of coastal erosion and sea level rise, leading to a loss of livelihoods and a reduction in livable lands. We note the further impacts of deforestation, intense and uncontrolled rainfall, floods and landslides, which have a massive impact on food crops, production and exports. We would therefore like to ask what more can be done by the government of Sao Tome and Principe to combat climate change and to ensure a more sustainable model of development. What would the expectations of Sao Tome and Principe in terms of the international community's response to these increasing crises? How could international funding be better utilized to support those who are most affected by climate change? How can international partners, including civil society organizations, play a useful role as partners to local communities to mitigate and reduce the impacts of climate change? Furthermore, what modalities did your government adopt to ensure meaningful participation of right holders groups, particularly those most affected by development changes in the elaboration of the VNR? what citizen-led engagement strategies have occurred to contribute to the national review process, and what plans does your government have to follow up the presentation of the VNR at national and subnational levels after the HLPF? Thank you. Thank the representative of the women's group. I now give the floor to Denmark to be followed by Argentina. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and we also wish to congratulate El Salvador and Sao Tome and Principe on your presentations here today. Our comments are for Somalia. Denmark congratulates Somalia on the submission of its first VNR and commends this step into harmonizing institutionalized policies for the betterment of its people. Somalia has made great strides as a frontrunner in the mobile money sector which has enabled access to user-friendly transactional platforms for many within the informal sectors. This is a positive development. However, in light of the ongoing droughts, rising food costs, limited access to resources and water that are impacting the lives of millions of Somalis, our question is, what has been done to ensure that adaptation and mitigation policies prioritize the inclusion and empowerment of marginalized and vulnerable actors in society, such as women, youth, and children? Thank you. Thank the representative of Denmark, and I give the floor to Argentina to be followed by Portugal. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. First of all, we wanted to congratulate El Salvador, Sao Tome and Principe and Somalia for their voluntary national review presentations. Argentina also presented its Vienna this year, and we appreciate the broad and profound work that needed to be carried out. And we think it's important to highlight the very good results that the three countries have shared with us. In particular, we wanted to emphasize the work of El Salvador in preparing its second Vienna, which demonstrates its deep commitment to the sustainable development goals it's working to accomplish. In particular, the prioritization of 10 most important SDGs has really worked well, and we see commendable progress since the previous VNR presented in 2017. Our question to the Vice President and the Minister, could you tell us which actions carried out by the government of El Salvador jointly with all of society have been particularly impactful and are a priority. Thank you. And for the question opposed, and I now give the floor to Portugal to be followed by Mexico. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, let me join others in commending El Salvador, Somalia, and Sontome and Principe for the presentation of their voluntary national reviews. And my remarks and questions are addressed to Sontome and Principe. Uh, Portugal partners with Sontome and Principe in, the, in a number of structuring areas such as education and health and we were pleased to see the progress achieved in these two areas. As a small island state, Sontome and Principe faces special challenges and vulnerabilities which will persist beyond graduation foreseen for December 2024 and which are to a great extent linked to the negative impacts of climate change. In line with the priorities defined by Santome and Principe, we have been working together to foster a low-carbon, sustainable economic development. In this context, could you please elaborate on how Santome and Principe is investing in the blue economy in order to reap the benefits of its large maritime territory? I thank you. Thank the representative of Portugal, and now the Mexico has the floor to be followed by Sweden, and then Sierra Leone, and that's the last speaker I have, and we close the list because we won't have time for answers. Mexico, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. We congratulate and welcome the Foreign Minister of Sao Tome and Principe. Mexico is thankful to your delegation for this excellent presentation of your first voluntary national review. With regard to the contents of the review, Mexico would like to know what were the most important challenges related to climate change that your country has confronted as a small island state, and what was highlighted in that regard in preparing your VNR. Thank you. Representative of Mexico, and now I give the floor to Sweden. I see Sierra Leone has withdrawn its request for the floor, so Sweden, you, okay, again, uh, Sweden, you have the floor, and then Sierra Leone. And thank you. Thank you all for interesting presentations, and my remarks and question goes to Somalia. The Somalian report really shows the importance to address the SDGs in an integrated way and to us all to take action against climate change. Somalia has done impressive work to track pro process, including the tool Goal Tracker Somalia. And my question is, what finding or gaps has surprised you the most in this process? I thank the representative of Sweden, and now I give the floor to our last speaker, Sierra Leone. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam President. Uh, let me use this opportunity to thank and congratulate the distinguished presenters from El Salvador, Sao Tome, and Principe, and Somalia. I want to particularly commend Sao Tome and Principe and Somalia as members of the G7 Plus group of conflict-affected and fragile states. Uh, trying to seek a better path towards uh, sustainable development. My question for the three countries is this. How um, have you set up your national statistical system to generate credible data for monitoring implementation of the SDGs? Thank you very much. Thank the representative of Sierra Leone for the question. And uh, now we are back to uh, the responses. Uh, we each delegation gets six minutes to respond, and we'll start in the order the presentations were made. I'll give the floor to the El Salvador team, and Her Excellency Ms. Adriana Mira de Pereira, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, will respond to the questions. You have the floor. Muchísimas gracias, señora Presidenta. He tomado nota. Thank you very much madam president i have taken note of all of the questions the dominican republican philippines argentina as well as civil society organizations uh, they asked questions about the right to education if i don't have the time to respond to all of them i will provide you with a written response shortly allow i would like allow me to speak about challenges first the main challenge which we face is that we do not have any kind of organization actively working on the progress on sdgs another challenge is technical in nature today thanks to the work of the vice president of the republic uh, who was appointed by the president to manage this process. We now have a monitoring platform for SDGs. 
that can be used by the public and we invite you to take a look at it. There's also a exhaustive report that goes with it. This was provided by the Secretariat for Innovation, which I would like to mention it. It was created by our president in order to bridge the technology gap. Another challenge is to uh, raise awareness among civil society organizations and other bodies with respect to the SDGs and their importance. We have also noted progress, not just in working with the government, but also with CSOs and academics under the leadership of the Vice President of the Republic. For the President, this is a priority issue. But we also know that we need to mobilize the entire population. We need to not only focus on how we can achieve the SDGs, but also on the specific SDGs. Uh, the Vice President is managing these efforts. And this plays a key role because it is a testament to the importance placed by El Salvador on these issues. We have already uh, conducted a VNR before. This is our second one. We have strengthened the system with monitoring control, mobilizing finance for development, and a fourth aspect, the Ministry of Finance, which plays a key role in ensuring financing and focusing on the operations and territorial scope of our work. All of this is done in the interest of our population. We have already presented nine priorities during the first VNR, and we have added one, which is SDG 8 for economic growth. This is a priority goal for the government as well. I would also like to specify what the priority plans are for my administration. First, we have a social development plan 2019-2024 for SDGs 1, 2, 4, and 5, the National Policy for Development of Early uh, Childhood Development is also key. It, it covers SDGs 2, 4, and 10. The Agriculture Plan, which aims to ensure food security, covers SDGs 10 and others. The National Justice and Health um, Security Policy has also allowed us to make progress on SDG 7. As for education, I would like to note that unfortunately we have experienced some years of violence and so our president has made security a priority to ensure economic and social growth of the country. He launched a regional control plan which not only fights violence but also allows us to fight the underlying causes of violence as for early childhood policies, we have adopted these uh, policies and others. The Ministry for Education, Science and Technology has also launched projects. Two weeks ago, we launched a special school project which aims to build new schools, but not just buildings. Here we will also be investing in the education system in a comprehensive manner. I would also like to tell you about a plan by the Ministry of Education. It involves multiple institutions and includes the project One Child, One Computer, which allows every student in the public school system to have access to the internet. This is very important for bridging the digital divide. Also, the executive uh, government, the executive power, has launched the School Administration and Public Powers Initiative. We are raising awareness among our administrators of all of these initiatives. Thank you, and if I have not answered all of your questions, I remain available to do so. Excellency Ms. Adriana Mirada Pereira, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of El Salvador, for the response. And I now give the floor to our next uh, responder, and that is Her Excellency Edith Ramos de Costa Tanjua, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Cooperation and Communities of South Uma and Principe. You have the floor, and you have six minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. 
Um, I'm going to address, I'll try my best to address uh, the questions that was made to me. And uh, to the civil society question, I would say, first of all, ourness, ourness, and ourness. Uh, more, than enough, more than ever, we need to implement policies in terms of the sustainable use of our resource, in terms of the protection of our forests, uh, the issue, addressing the issues of the flotation, and uh, controlling certain aspects. Um, I would like also to just to refer that San Domain and Principe, as a small country, is, is a country that has vocation for tourism. We don't have major industry, and basically we don't pollute, but we face uh, the consequence of climate change. So in our side, what we have to do, we have to control the cutting of the trees. We need to control the removal of the sands in our beach. Those are the main aspects for an insular country, apart from the policies, of course, that is embedded in what the country already decides and defined as essential. But you put another aspect that is very relevant, that is what is our expectation uh, in terms of our partner. And I would like to say that our expectations are high, exactly because what I said, we basically don't have industry in San Domingue, Brazil. We don't pollute much. So we, our expectation is in terms of our partners also to recognize that we are facing and we are paying part of the bill of the situation that we are not creating, if I may say like that. And let me say that uh, year by year we used to urge about climate change and climate change, but nowadays we are feeling in our skins, if I say, what is the climate change in San Domingue's principle. Uh, in terms of the sustainable development, you mentioned the aspect of SDGs. Of course, they are very important. It is totally embedded in what is our agenda for development, aligned with the 20, agenda for 2030 agenda. And of course, it also has to be a great commitment from our people. There is work to be done inside of our borderlines. Our people also need to be committed with that responsibility, understanding, of course, that our resources are totally limited and they need to be used in a very sustainable way. I will now address uh, the question or, that was made by Portugal. Our brothers from Portugal, yes, that is a very important partner and that I might say that uh, helping us a lot in terms of what is our indicators, in particular in terms of education and health. Um, in terms, of course, bilateral uh, relations, but not only. Um, the question was if you are investing in blue economy. And the question and the answer will be most, first of all, what I had the opportunity to refer that San Tome, first of all, San Tome in Principe, although it's a small country, but our sea is 160 times bigger than our land. So it means that the sea is something that is very relevant for us, although we didn't make this. Uh, development of it uh, before. But of course, uh, we realize it more than ever, and this is the reason why I said that we had the opportunity in 2019 to approve a blue economy transition strategy that uh, is, of course, linked with the sea and the ocean strategies, and of course, is our desire to implement it. Um, when we speak about blue economy, we heard it everywhere, internationally, regionally, internally also we, we do you know, seminars about it. But we also want to understand clearly how can we make this thing work. And it's you know, through the relationship with our partners that we can see what the sea can give us in terms of blue economy, energy, fishery, so many other things. If we notice, we just have recently in Lisbon uh, the sea convention that was organized by Portugal and Kenya, and of course the blue economy was on the top of the, the, the table. For a country like us that is totally surrounded by water, we don't have other options. That is the truth. But of course, in order for us uh, to do something in terms of blue economy, there is work that we have to do indoors, strengthening our good governance, of course, strengthening uh, transparency, consolidation of our democracy, and of course the rule of law. Um, and another aspect also I think is relevant to mention when I'm speaking about blue economy is the issue of security. 
as an island that is in the Gulf of Guinea, and we face challenge in terms of piracy, maritime piracy in that particular area. And we need also to address that. And when I'm saying, I'm speaking that, I'm speaking about maritime crimes. I'm speaking about illegal fishery. Those, those are the concerns that we have that we address in terms of inter, internal uh, policy of the country, but also in terms of bilateral and multilateral cooperation. Uh, to Mexico, uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, you ask what is our ma major challenge uh, in terms of climate change, and I would say that our ma biggest challenge is that it became a reality for us. We used to worry about it, but today we can feel it, as I said before. We used to worry about problems of floods in India, in East Timor, about tornadoes in America, and so on. And now we have floods in Saint Tome, the beautiful islands of Saint Tome and Principe. We have them in December, we have them in March, we have them in May, and they have huge consequences for us, for a country that is so small and with so small population. And uh, what I can say is that, you know, we'll have people, we lost some lives, not many, but we lost them. And even if it's only one woman being, is a life and it has value for all of us. We lost infrastructure, all the bridge that we have in the country was totally destroyed. What brings to us problems in terms of infrastructure and it makes people more vulnerable than ever. That is the truth because they lost their houses, uh, they need uh, uh, access to water, they need, um, in terms of mobility and so many, many other things. Um, I think I need, I can't say <laughs> too much at this point in time. I'm just very quickly to address uh, Sierra Leone as also a partner in terms of the G7 Plus. Uh, what I can say is that, uh, pertaining to your question, we are including, you know, the implementation of the SDGs in our, you know, national agenda. And as part of that, of that, of course, we need to find the ways, of course, and the mechanisms also um, to fulfill it. Thank you very much. I thank Her Excellency, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Cooperation, Communities of Sao Tome and Principal for the responses provided. And now I give the floor to Mr. Sharmark Farah, Director General of the National Bureau of Statistics of Somalia, to respond to the questions posed. And you have six minutes, sir. Thank you, Vice President. We would like to thank the kind remarks and the pertinent questions posed by the distinguished delegates. We will try to respond to all, but if we are not able to address them, all the questions, please note that we are providing a more detailed written response after the session. Uh, first, we would like to thank uh, the distinguished uh, Swiss delegates for their kind remarks and questions. We would also like to thank the Swiss for their valuable support to our VNR process. Switzerland is a key partner in Somalia's development. About addressing urbanization uh, while strengthening rural uh, areas, as noted in the pre presentation, there is a high urbanization rate in Somalia. To address the, this, the Ministry of Public Works and Housing is implementing a major project entitled Somalia Urban Resilience and Planning Project with the support of the World Bank and other donors. The project is currently focused on seven uh, major towns, but it's been expand expanded to other uh, cities, other major cities in Somalia. We would also like to thank the distinguished de delegates from the Swedish government for their remarks and questions. Sweden is a key, also a key partner of Somalia's development. Uh, in terms of the, the questions that was posed to us in, in order to address or to assure that VNR data was, the, our VNR was data-driven and evidence-based, we developed a groundbreaking digital platform called Gold Tracker Somalia. Gold Tracker allows us to analyze in great detail data availability and data gaps in Somalia. Data availability is a great challenge in most countries, but we, are most, we, we were surprised to see that we had a data for more than 50% of the so-called TOR indicators. However, we also analyze the current uh, data ecosystem in Somalia, and, 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 and we see that it is really quite fragmented. A lot of data is already held, actually always held by the international agencies as noted earlier in our presentation. We thank the uh, Norway for, uh, or, or the distinguished delegates from Norway for their remarks and question. Norway is also a major uh, development partner in Somalia. Uh, regarding revenue mobilization, as is stated in the challenges slide of our presentation, domestic revenue is currently really low. 
government uh, continues to make efforts to strengthen public financial management reforms and resource mobilization. Domestic revenue mobilization is one of the key priorities of the new administration. The government will, will soon unveil plans to, for a new, new institutional framework for resource mobilization and also increase in the tax base. We thank the Finnish uh, government for their remarks and questions. Finland is also a key partner in Somalia. The government uh, recognizes the importance of social protection, especially during COVID and the current drought. As a result, safety net projects have been strengthened uh, in the past couple of years. In terms of improving coordination, the, we are glad to note that relations between the federal government and the federal member states has actually improved significantly significant in the last two months. The new administration is also committed to reviewing and streamlining the coordination of social protection. The project that you referred to, uh, Bahnano, has also components for establishing more, frame, for more strengthened and effective frameworks and coordination. We thank the Danish government for their remarks and uh, question. Uh, leave no one behind and inclusivity, uh, inclusivity in our uh, development is one of the key components of, uh, of the National Development Plan. And access to services for minorities and mar marginalized communities uh, have actually improved in the uh, past uh, decade. Also, the government is committed to the climate and uh, adaptation and mitigation policies. We have recently ratified the United Nations Framework Con Convention on Climate Change, otherwise known as Paris the Agreement on Climate Change. We've also established a directorate for environment and uh, climate change. We've also uh, established uh, IGAT, or the Africa's Intergovernmental Authority on Development Climate Change Center in Mogadishu. Finally, I would like to thank um, the remarks made by the workers and trade unions. Uh, I'm glad to note that uh, Somalia is committed to one person, one vote. And uh, as a prerequisite for, for this, we are currently conducting or planning to conduct a census uh, in 2024. Somalia is also committed to both SDG 8 and SDG 16. The provisional uh, constitution protects workers and journalists alike. And the current ad administration has actually prioritized employment uh, creation. It's not only part of the economic growth agenda, but it's also part of improving security in Somalia. Thank you so much. I thank Mr. Sharma. Farah, uh, Director General of the National Bureau of the Statistics of Somalia for the responses provided. And we have come to the end of this panel, uh, and I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate all three countries for the presentations and for the VNRs. And um, we have, uh, now we are going to pause for a second. Please don't uh, leave your seats uh, and remain uh, silent uh, until we change the panel and we'll, heard, uh, we'll hear the Voluntary National Review of Dominica. Colleagues, could you please take your seats?
Colleagues, we need to resume the meeting. Please take your seats. The meeting is now resumed and uh, we'll hear the Voluntary National Review by Dominica and I invite His Excellency Vince Henderson, Minister for Planning, Economic Development, Climate Resilience, Sustainable Development and Renewable Energy of Dominica to make a presentation. Please, um, I ask for your attention. Thank you. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Delegates representatives brothers and sisters ladies and gentlemen pleasant good day I am pleased to be here today to share the first voluntary national review of the Commonwealth of Dominica which really is our story we are Whitey Kubuli the nature isle of the Caribbean officially known as the Commonwealth of Dominica or simply Dominica our story is one of vulnerability resilience and sustainability. Our story cannot be told without mention of our vulnerability to the effects of climate change and other exogenous shocks, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, which have further underscored the multi-hazard environment in which we exist. A little short of five years ago, in 2017, Dominica was completely devastated by Hurricane Maria, a Category 5 hurricane which resulted in losses amounting to 226% of our GDP, causing significant destruction to every sector and community. This disaster did not only impact the physical environment or the country's economic growth trajectory, but also exposed Dominica's socioeconomic vulnerabilities, inflicting hardship on our people. Notwithstanding Hurricane Maria, provided us with a unique opportunity to review our development pathway and create new solutions and ambitions to advance our sustainable development prospects. We recognize that development is underpinned, that is underpinned by a resilience agenda is key to sustainably uplifting Dominicans towards our shared vision for the future and achieving the sustainable development goals set by the, by the United Nations. Over the past several years, our government has approved three key policy documents to achieve our ambitions. The National Resilience Development Strategy, the NRDS, Dominica's Climate Resilience and Recovery Plan 2020-2030, the CRRP, and the Disaster Risk Financing Strategy. These documents represent our roadmap for achieving the 2030 Agenda. Your Excellencies, brothers and sisters, the last line in the third stanza of our national anthem reads, all for each and each for all. Consequently, stakeholder engagement on the pin by participatory process are commonplace in Dominica and were key to the development of these key policy documents. In fact, Several decision-making processes, and indeed the development of this VNR, benefited from the perspectives and voices of civil society organizations, youth and children, private sector, academia, trade unions, development partners, and our indigenous Kalinago community. Our citizens, including those in the diaspora, are key to deciding the future that they want for themselves, for our beloved country and for future generations. This approach to our development is contributing to higher levels and more sustained ownership of the SDGs and a future based on a collective vision and consensus. Dominica therefore fully embraces the notion of leaving no one behind. Madam President, I now invite invite you on a multimedia journey as we share how we are building the world's first climate resilient island states and the gold standard for resilience in small island developing states. Here we have the video.
our story as a small island developing state is one of vulnerability, resilience, and sustainability propelled by a worthy ambition to build the world's first climate resilient country. Dominica's story of development cannot be told without mention of our vulnerability to the effects of climate change and other exogenous shocks, which further underscore the multi-hazard environment in which we exist. Hurricane Maria, whilst bringing much destruction, has afforded Dominica the opportunity to put in place a well-designed resilience agenda and roadmap to achieve the SDGs and achieve our vision and ambition to become the world's first climate-resilient country. Our National Development Plan, the National Resilience Development Strategy, and Dominica's Climate Resilience and Recovery Plan 2020-2030 represent the country's roadmap for achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Our development pathway reflects our strong history of people-centered development and will enable us to live up to the ambitions of the 2030 Agenda. We are already seeing big wins under each of the 17 goals. We consider social protection a basic human right, and this has translated into Dominica having in place over 30 safety net programs to not only ensure zero poverty, but to support our long-term transformation and the creation of more adaptive and resilient communities and people in Dominica. We continue to strive for food security. We are a green and organic island. We credit our consumption of local foods with the longevity of our population. Dominica has the most centenarians per capita and the longest life expectancy in the Caribbean. Agriculture continues to be one of the key drivers of our economy. We are combating the threat of climate change to agriculture by establishing a global center for agriculture resilience that will enable us to be a best practice center for climate smart agriculture. We are committed to achieving universal health for all and providing our population with world-class health facilities as well as smart health centers. We are proud to say that we have almost eliminated maternal mortality, which has been at one to zero deaths for several years. Our enrollment rate of primary schools is 100%, with secondary education not far behind. We have been building smart schools across Dominica that are resilient and designed to mitigate multi-hazards, utilizing modern technology for instruction and learning. In 1980, Dominica elected the first female Prime Minister in the Caribbean. Today, women continue to dominate several areas of leadership. 61% of all heads of the public sector are women, and 23.5% of our parliament are women, above the global average. 98% of our population has access to safe drinking water, and more than 80% of our population uses safely managed sanitation services. We also generate about 37% of our electricity from hydropower. 100% of our citizens have access to electricity, and our target is that by 2030, 100% of our electricity will be generated from renewables. Our first 10 megawatts geothermal plant will be commissioned by the end of 2024. We are ensuring a decent work agenda and are particularly focused on reducing youth unemployment through our flagship national employment program, the development of MSMEs, and the continued development of the tourism sector based on the principles of community engagement, conservation of the natural environment, and preservation of Dominica's authentic culture. We continue to invest in disaster risk financing instruments to reduce budget volatility when natural disasters strike and have recently developed our first disaster risk financing strategy. We are building stronger with resilient economic infrastructure. As we strive to advance our knowledge-based economy, we are on course to make full use of digital technologies across all sectors. The government of Dominica recognizes that inequality remains one of the greatest impediments to equitable people-centered development, and therefore government is forging ahead through the introduction of a range of projects and programs 
to reduce the pockets of inequality that exist. Among the Caribbean's few remaining indigenous groups, the Kalinago reside in Dominica. We understand their unique needs and our development processes ensure that they are integral to developmental dialogues. We are creating and making our communities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. We are well underway with our national housing revolution. 90% of our housing stock was either destroyed or partially destroyed by Hurricane Maria. We banned single-use plastics in 2018 and we have restricted imports of non-biodegradable containers. We continue to introduce waste diversion programs and the three hours, reduce, reuse and recycle are part of national policy. Prospective avenues and investments in waste management and waste to energy programs are being pursued. We are inculcating resilience at all levels and we are taking all steps to climate-proof Dominica. The Climate Resilience Execution Agency for Dominica is leading the charge of rebuilding Dominica and leading our resilience efforts. We have introduced the Modern Climate Resilience Act and have set 20 climate resilience targets for all our sectors to achieve our vision. Our marine environment contributes 25% to our GDP and we continue to focus on sustainably developing our blue economy. We are the nature isle of the Caribbean. 60% of our land is covered by forests. We have six protected areas and we consider our natural environment as the foundation upon which our social and economic development is built. We consider governance as key to underpinning sustainable development. We foster transparency, accountability and citizen participation in development. The 2021 World Citizenship Report ranks Dominica as the third safest country in Latin America and the Caribbean and the 33rd safest place in the world. Our redevelopment and our thrust to become the world's first climate resilient country is underpinned by stakeholder engagement and valuable partnerships. We continue to be supported by so many development partners, our own citizens and our dynamic citizen by investment program, all working towards ensuring that the ambition of this nature isle is achieved. We thank all our partners and stakeholders that are with us on this journey to 2030. Thank you. Madam President, I am sure that you and all the colleagues there are wondering, how do I get to Dominica? I could tell you that after the presentation, so please feel free. <laughs> but having viewed all of you in our presentation, I know that you too recognize that as a small island state, our development gains over the years have been impressive in spite of the many challenges. We are building forward stronger and building more inclusive and an equal society. We are on the path to achieving the SDGs. Our first VNR reflects and reaffirms our commitment to advance the global agenda. Although Dominica's resilience agenda and vision are fully aligned with the SDGs, we recognize that the SDGs necessitate much more than that. As a global community, we must recognize that small island states need more to move a pace to 2030. But we can only do so with the partnership and commitment of this community. Otherwise, we will be traveling a long and lonely road to 2030. Our drive and ambitions are crystal clear, but our realities on the ground risk obscuring that clarity. Like many other SIDS, our inherent vulnerabilities are exacerbated by limited fiscal space, compounded by the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, a hostile global economic financial system where GDP per capita is a false metric of development, its continued use as a condition for developing countries to access official development assistance and concessional financing inhibits our ability to address our vulnerabilities and development needs in a sustained way. 
a, an international trading system in which the WTO rules continue to impair the sustainable growth and development of our island states. We therefore call for special and differential treatment, especially for trading agricultural products. And we recognize that climate change is a clear and present danger to our survival. We know that the importation of fossil fuel deepens the economic vulnerability of small island developing states. And we have identified the transition to renewable energy as a key to, the, to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and building resilience to economic and climate shocks. In Dominica, the development of geothermal energy is at an advanced stage of development. We expect to commission our first 10 megawatt geothermal power plant by the end of 2024. We are also pursuing the production of green hydrogen, utilizing our abundant geothermal resources for the development of an eco-industrial park. This will undoubtedly expand our economy, create more opportunities for people, and will contribute to the achievement of the SDGs. SEEDS urgently needs support and greater investments in development and deployment of renewable energy technologies. In particular, SEEDS need greater focus in base load, suitable and adaptive renewable energy technologies, geothermal energy, small-scale waste to energy facilities, research and development, and the deployment of ocean and wave technologies. After all, we are large ocean states. Achieving the SDGs in Dominica, as well as our country's 20 resilience targets, requires adequate and sustained levels of resources. We are firm in our view that now is the time to translate conversations into deliberate actions. And for this, we need your support. We are here to work collectively through bilateral and multilateral agreements to mobilize much needed resources and access to grants and concessionary financing. We want to work collectively for our partners to better understand and implement new and innovative forms of financing to advance our development, including a focus on non-traditional donors and new and emerging financial instruments, such as blue and green bonds and blended financing. We continue to invest heavily in the productive sectors, with increasing amounts being invested in agriculture, tourism, the digital economy, and the service industry generally, value added especially from agricultural produce, and light manufacturing. We are deliberately pursuing foreign direct investments to boost the productive sector, especially by leveraging our natural assets to build an economy that is both blue and green. Our Citizenship by Investment program has proven to be an excellent resource in financing many aspects of Dominica's development. Our expenditures and investments post Hurricane Maria and also during the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as our projects and programs to build resilience and build forward stronger, are mainly being financed from inflows from our Citizenship by Investment program. Our government continues to create an enabling environment to increase private sector involvement and investments in the development pathway, while complementing fiscal reforms that will improve the ease of doing business and generate high and sustained economic growth. Our infrastructural development has been largely influenced by incorporating climate resilience and adaptation measures for building stronger forward. We continue to leverage public-private partnerships in urban development, sustainably, sustainability at the level of communities, and energy diversification, among others. These are all in pursuit of accelerating SDG delivery. Madam President, I am winding up, but it would be remiss of me if I do not include the following. Clearly, financing is not all. We are fully cognizant that the public sector plays a key role in the implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of programs and projects. There is need for public sector enhancement, which is currently ongoing, to create greater efficiencies in the delivery, monitoring, and evaluation of projects towards the SDGs. This will enable us to enhance the delivery of goods and services. This will help to build higher levels of trust between government and citizens. As we work to prioritize resilience and to create enduring prosperity for our people, 
we will be leaning heavily on the knowledge, perspectives, and experiences of our partners around the world. We too have much to offer. And through this process, we will continue to share our experiences, recommendations, and solutions as we journey to build the world's first climate resilient country and become the gold standard in resilience for small island developing states. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the Minister for Planning, Economic Development, Climate Resilience, Sustainable Development and Renewable Energy of Dominica for the presentation. And I now open the floor for comments and questions. As uh, you're aware, the time limit for comments and questions is two minutes. Please observe it because unfortunately the microphones will be cut off. And um, the first speaker I have is the permanent representative of Morocco. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Madam President. Mr. Minister, I would like to congratulate the government of Dominica for the comprehensive presentation of its VNR, and we commend the progress achieved in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda, despite various challenges facing your country, particularly ad the adverse effects of climate change. Our questions are related to this context as well as to Dominica's effort in the disaster risk reduction. As you have already said, Mr. Minister, in 2017, Dominica was devastated by Category 5 hurricane Maria, grossly impacting the country's GDP. We saw in your video that Dominica is not only resilient, Dominica is rebuilding, Dominica is educating, Dominica is offering better future to its uh, youth, and also uh, empowering women in the government and also in the parliament. So in this uh, context, my question is, how has Dominica been able to ensuring its disaster risk reduction and that it is better preparedness for future impact of natural disasters? And my second question, what systems, if any, have been developed to safeguard the country's food security in this context? And just one last comment, Mr. Minister. You, we will not let you go alone to 2030. We will be with you, and you will not be uh, facing all these challenges alone. And the community international will never let you down. Thank you. I thank the representative of Morocco for the comments and the question, and now give the floor to Canada to be followed by Georgia. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, congratulations to the Government of the Commonwealth of Dominica for presenting its first voluntary national review. And let me, through you, also congratulate all of the staff and workers um, back home who work not only on your VNR, but on your three policies that you described and indeed on the ongoing recovery from Hurricane uh, Maria. Canada has been and continues to be a committed development partner to Dominica and to the region. Um, looking more specifically at SDG 13 and climate action, we really applaud uh, the goal that Dominica has set of becoming the world's first climate resilient nation. Um, as was noted, women and girls across the world, and particularly in small island developing states, often bear the brunt of the adverse impacts of climate change. Indigenous communities are also critical actors in their response to climate change. Excellency, as you noted yourself and, and was noted in the video, Dominica is home to the Kalinago people, one of the few indigenous communities in the Caribbean. How will Dominica ensure that the Kalinago people continue to play an active and meaningful role in Dominica's goal of becoming the world's first climate resilient nation? Thank you very much. Thank the representative of Canada for the comments and the question. And I now give the floor to Georgia to be followed by uh, the major group for children and youth who will be connecting via VTC. Georgia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. We also would like to join congratulations and we congratulate. It was, uh, we have uh, here today a very impressive and comprehensive presentation about Dominica's development. So uh, 
quite many important issues we have covered during the presentation, uh, especially uh, economic development towards the climate resilience somehow. And uh, particularly, it was interesting that as a small island developing state, Dominica has taken on the challenge of uh, exploring the geothermal resources. And this is very important and interesting subject, interesting direction for economic development development for many countries, including my country. So uh, our question will be um, uh, what are uh, uh, what we are some of the challenges posed uh, by the um, uh, undertaking and how have you been uh, able to overcome these challenges and what the status of today's uh, of development the geothermal and how you are using this energy so far. Thank you so much. Thank the representative of uh, Georgia, and I now uh, give the floor to the major group for children and youth, who is connecting by VTC to be followed by Venezuela. So uh, our question will be, um, uh, what are, uh, what we are, some of yes, the... Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. You can start. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. We are grateful for the opportunity to contribute our comments and questions on the first VAR delivered by Dominica. After experiencing a series of natural disasters and the COVID-19 pandemic and its wider social and economic effects, Dominica's resilience as a small island developing state would have surely been tested. It would have also exposed our areas of vulnerability. Nevertheless, as we return to our new normal post both disasters, this experience should not hinder us but encourage us to be more committed to educating our populace on the importance of sustainable development. Overall, based on the plans outlined in the VNR, we believe that Dominica is on the right track to achieving the SDGs and becoming a climate resilient country. However, we realize that much more can be done for a more equitable engagement, particularly in mobilizing the differently abled the youth and the LGBTQ community, indigenous community, and civil society organizations. It is important that all groups, especially these vulnerable groups, are engaged. My first question, please, could the government outline how they intend to provide new opportunities for broader engagement and participation of these diverse populations to truly leave no one behind? Also, from cleanup campaigns, we realize that littering, improper garbage disposal, lack of recycling of non-biodegradable waste, and improper land usage practices poses a threat to ecosystems and our biodiversity. We ask, can the government brief on any environmental policies that will be implemented to encourage a more circular economy as we market ourselves as an organic island? Uh, I thank the representative of VECLAC. Actually, there was a, a, some mix up and uh, they gave the floor to the regional commission. Uh, and now we'll hear Venezuela and then we'll go to the major group uh, for children and youth. Venezuela, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. We would like to congratulate the Commonwealth of Dominica on an excellent presentation, and we've had long-standing cooperation with your country. You're working diligently to implement the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, despite the very serious challenges that you've had to deal with inter alia the pandemic and climate change, including, of course, Hurricane Erica in 2015 and Maria in 2017. 
which caused to highly deplorable losses, both human and economic, and in particular damaged the tourist sector. In this regard, we have a question. As part of this interactive dialogue, our brothers of Dominica and their minister present here, how did COVID-19 and related measures impact your health system? And how did Dominica respond particularly to protect the most vulnerable segments of the population since the beginning of the pandemic? And what measures were put in place to strengthen its national health system? Thank you very much once again, Madam Chair, and again, congratulations to Dominica. Thank you for Venezuela for the comments and the question. And now I actually give the floor to ECLAC. Apparently, this was the VTC was with the uh, major group for children and youth. Uh, sorry for the confusion. So, ECLAC, you have the floor. And that is our last speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. ECLAC congratulates Dominica on the presentation of its first uh, voluntary national review, and the Commission was very pleased to have supported this effort. The government of, and the people demonstrated the essence of a truly consultative process in the preparation of the VNR, with the active participation of the full range of stakeholders, notably the indigenous people of Dominica, the Carinagos, demonstrating the commitment to leave no one behind. The Dominican experience epitomizes the multidimensional challenges faced by many uh, of the island states of the Caribbean, notwithstanding persistent economic infrastructural devastation caused by extreme climatic events with social welfare concerns further aggravated by COVID-19. Dominica has remained resolute in advancing its sustainable development strategy and empowering its people. Investment in social protection programs has cushioned the effects of the pandemic, and the implementation of restoration and reforestation programs has halted uh, biodiversity loss, consistent with the country's determination to become uh, the first climate resilient country. I would be very interested to know whether there were significant lessons learned in the wake of Tropical Storm Erica and Hurricane Maria that are being applied towards building a more resilient Dominica. Thank you very much. Thank the representative of ECLAC for the question. And uh, this was our last speaker, so I'll, hand, um, back, I'll give back the floor to the Minister for Planning, Economic Development, Climate Resilience, Sustainable Development, and Renewable Energy of Dominica to respond. <laughs> Uh, you have a very long title, <laughs> sir, uh, and uh, you get six minutes to do that. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam President. I also wish to take the opportunity to thank ECLAC for their support throughout this process and to thank the staff of the Ministry of Economic Planning and Development. I won't say the rest. <laughs> Join you, Madam President. But I want to thank the, my ministry for the work that, that they've done, Permanent Secretary Gloria Joseph, Chief um, Planner, development planner, Dr. Zhajak, and Mrs. Ammonia role for the for the job that they have, the role that they have played in this process. Madam President, some very interesting questions, and um, I will do my best to respond. Um, some of which I would be very happy to provide in in writing. But let me begin by by thanking all those who contributed to the process, who now who are engaged in the process by asking some of some very important questions. Um, my friend from, the, from Morocco, the King of Morocco, thank you very much. Um, and also thank you for your contribution towards our development. And um, we know that you have played a very important role pre and post Hurricane Maria, and now as we go through the COVID-19 pandemic. We have learned a number of lessons from Hurricane Maria. And consequently, we have committed ourselves to building the first climate resilient nation in the world. As part of that process, we created what is called the Climate Resilience 
executing agency of Dominica, which effectively is responsible for charting the path for us to pursue that grand vision. As a result of, of um, the impact and the lessons we've learned, we have taken a number of actions, some legislative and some through the implementation of projects and programs. One major legislative initiative that we've taken is the promulgation of new building codes, building codes that will ensure that we can build stronger and build forward. We have also ensured that through training, consultation, we have brought in the builders and contractors throughout the country. We've worked with all ministries of government and to ensure that they know how to build back, how to build stronger and to build forward. We have also undertaken, as a government, a commitment to build 5,000 new homes. And as a result, we have been able to build new communities with some of the, the modern facilities, but communities that are also resilient with water storage capabilities, alternative sources of, of um, electricity to ensure that in the event of a major hurricane that they, we, they can continue um, operating. And we have set 20 major targets to meet that will ensure that we are, in fact, resilient to the impact of climate change, especially to metro, hydro meteorological events like hurricanes and storms, floods, and et cetera. With the question by, by our friends from Canada, and I also want to take the opportunity to thank um, the government of Canada for being a friend um, since independence. I must um, mention that most of us of, of my age went to schools that were built by, our, by the government of Canada, and I want to continue to thank you for that. And in recent times, post-Hurricane Maria, the Canadian government has been helping us to build resilient schools, and thank you very much for that contribution. The role of our indigenous Kalinago people in our development is key because they are who we are. The Kalinago people are us, and, and we are we are them. And therefore, they play a very important role in our development and every aspect of our development. We have created a, a Ministry of Kalinago Affairs, which is really Kalinago Upliftment, sorry, which is also responsible for the environment and charged for some of the responsibilities on our climate resilience and SDG um, programs. And therefore, they are integrally involved in the process, and they are playing a very important role, and, we, and I, I will add that they have a, a, a significant slice of the budget to ensure that we can build climate resilience. We are building new homes in the Kalinago territory, being financed by the, by the European Commission and the government of Dominica to ensure that we can provide more res resilient structures. We are building new facilities, community facilities, the, the new health centers and other facilities to ensure that they can actively get involved in our development. With regards to economic development, we have the Kalinago Development Fund, which, is, which was launched last year to ensure that we can further empower our indigenous people so that they can themselves be included in the development process of Dominica. Georgia, I want to thank you for that question, geothermal resources. As the, the one who's been charged for the development of all geothermal resources for the last 20 years, I can tell you of the many challenges. I will not tell you all today, otherwise we'll not live here. But in fact, there are, there are tremendous challenges, but the challenges that we've been faced with are basically the same challenges that all, all the small island developing states are faced with in the transition to renewable energy. Geothermal energy being capital intensive and technology intensive as well, it has been a, a major challenge. We are now constructing a plant with, that requires investment of 75 million US dollars, which is a significant amount compared to the size of our national budget. And our efforts at public-private partnerships have not been successful to date, but we continue to pursue the development of our geothermal resources. We are now seeking to utilize that resource to produce green hydrogen, which will give us an opportunity to create new industries, especially clean industries, so that we can transform our country and we can help in the pursuit of our sustainable development goals. 
I, I must respond to, sorry, the question by uh, the youth and children because uh, they are very important and they play a very important role in our development. There was a question about engagement and I would, I would prefer, Madam Chair, if you, President, if you would allow me to, to just read a small um, part of my response. Um, government continues to adopt a people-centered approach to development in an attempt to improve the quality of life of all Dominicans. Dominica's social protection system offers over 30 programs that target vulnerable groups and individuals by providing safety nets for multiplicity and multidimensionality of risk with coverage from cradle to grave. The government of Dominica ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and Optional Protocol in 2012, which is an international human rights instrument of the United Nations intended to protect the rights and dignity of persons with disabilities. Dominica's ratification of the convention endorsed the government's support and obligation for the implementation of the provisions of the convention at the national level. The government of the Commonwealth of Dominica via the Ministry of Youth Development and Empowerment, Youth at Risk, Gender Affairs, Seniors, Security and Dominicans with Disabilities established the National Commission of Persons with Disabilities with an inaugural meeting held in March of this year. Active engagement of the migrant subgroups has been ongoing as part of the process in providing critical information to inform the development of Dominica's social protection policy strategy as well as population policy. There's a strong focus on stakeholder engagement among all groups, including the Kalinago community. There's a strong focus on continuing education, capacity building, entrepreneurial skills, programs, and citizen empowerment all in an effort to ensure the engagement of all groups in society, leaving no one behind. We, in the process of preparing for the VNR, included all the groups within the society, and we formalized this engagement by a decision of the cabinet to establish a national committee for the VNR, which meets on a regular basis. The committee is tasked with providing strategic input and direction to the development of the VNR and is made up of representatives from the public and private sector and civil society organizations and also includes representations from the United Nations agencies. The committee also responsible for reviewing the draft VNR report, verify accuracy of information and data, etc., prior to the submission today. This committee is also supported by the United Nations country team in Dominica and other UN agencies. So Madam President, we continue to engage in public sensitization and awareness plans and have, and have been engaging all groups in the society, encouraging submissions of, of questions, concerns, and contributions to this process. Finally, with regards to the question raised on waste, I just wanted to, to briefly mention, and I said in my presentation that we are engaging in the development of waste to energy and other, other aspects of waste management to ensure that we can participate in the, <laughs> in the cyclical economy. So I just wanted to say that, uh, Madam <laughs> President, thank you for your generosity, and I hate to, uh, to have rushed through the responses, but I wanted to ensure that I respond to every question which was asked. We can submit to you in writing if you so desire. Thank you. I thank the Minister for Planning, Economic Development, Climate Resilience, Sustainable Development and Renewable Energy, Dominica, for the responses provided and uh, for the excellent presentation. I'm sure a lot of people here would like to visit Dominica now. Uh, and uh, with that, we have concluded our program of work this morning. I would like to express our appreciation to the representatives of El Salvador, South Oman, Principe, Somali, and Dominica for the presentations and for all of you who participated in the interactive discussion. Special thanks to the interpreters for working extra time today with us. Uh, and the forum will reconvene this afternoon at 3 p.m. to continue its program of work. Detailed information is available on the HOPF website. The meeting is adjourned. Congratulations Thank you. once again. Thank you. Thank you.